Welcome to Cannabis Health Radio, a podcast where we share stories from people around the world who are using cannabis as medicine. The information is meant to raise awareness about the health benefits of cannabis, but should not be taken as medical advice. Now, here are your hosts, Ian Jessup and Corey Yelland. And we welcome you to another episode of Cannabis Health Radio. I'm Ian Jessup. And I'm Corey Ellen. To me, it's mind-boggling that more than 2 million women around the world are diagnosed with breast cancer each year. 2 million women. It's the most common cancer for women. And joining us today from California to tell us her story is Tone and her husband, Alex. They don't want us to use their last name, so we won't. Before we get into your story, Tone, how did the two of you hear about Cannabis Health Radio? Well, thank you so much and good morning to the both of you. So um, when I initially found out, it was actually through Alex. He was sending me information um, regarding um, Rick Simpson oil, cannabis, and how it can help uh, clear cancer. But I, unfortunately, wasn't uh, opening up the information that he was sending me. Mm-hmm. It wasn't until um, I became ill, and that's when I then when I started looking online myself. I was researching three and four hours a day, and then I think I was putting in just cannabis and how it clears cancer. And then your podcast opened up, and the rest is history for us. Wow, Tone, your medical journey began in 2017. Take us back to that time and tell us some of the health issues you were facing that caused you concern. Well, what was interesting is back in 2017, I was working a lot of hours. I was normally working um, 16, anywhere from 12 to 16 hours a day, and I'm in law enforcement. So in 2017, I noticed that I was having two menstrual cycles a month. It's unusual, but I thought because of the stress and the line of work that I was in, I wasn't getting enough rest or eating correctly, that that's why I was having problems with my menstrual cycle. Well, for a year, it went on, and I finally got checked out, And be- but before I got the results, Alex and I decided to go vegan. We were thinking, well, maybe we can correct it through being vegan. So we went vegan for nine months, but after that first month in 2000, I think, well, 2017, we, we went, I'm sorry, 2017, I was having two menstrual cycles. In 2018, um, January 1st, we went vegan. And after a month of being vegan, we actually was able to get my cycle regulated. So I started having a cycle once a month. In February, that's when we got the bad news. And what was the bad news? Well, um, please excuse me if I get emotional. Um, We went in for a mammogram and a sonogram. They found... Um, a mass and unfortunately it came down to breast cancer stage 1b invasive ductal carcinoma and it was estrogen and progesterone positive and her negative that must have been a hell of a shock for you it was you know i have fibrocystic breasts so when i normally check my breasts every month they are, are they, i feel granules or lumps but this particular time when I checked my breast, it felt a little different and it was right near the areola. So that's when we scheduled the mammogram and the sonograms. Was it a large lump? No, it felt like it was half an inch in diameter, but it just felt different. Unusually clumpy or lumpy, I should say. Do you think at some level you kind of knew, Ton? Yes. Once I did the did the breast exam myself in the shower, I, I got a little worried because I'm like, this feels different. This might be, but let's just confirm it getting checked out. And I wasn't even 50 years old. And I don't know how it is in Canada, but in California, under my healthcare coverage, they say you start getting mammograms at 50. And I hadn't, I wasn't even 50 yet. I was only 47. So what was the uh, protocol that you, the doctors suggested you follow? 
Well, initially, everything was so quick. What they did was they immediately, uh, my OBGYN immediately had me talk to one surgeon. He said, because I'm young, um, we should just go ahead and do um, a mastectomy. And to be safe, I could even do the bilateral mastectomy, which where they take out both breasts. We were asking a lot of questions. And my husband was like, wait a minute, this is going really fast. Can, can we just ask some questions? So we were asking a lot of questions because he had already done a lot of research on it. Mm-hmm. And I think after the 10th question, the surgeon got frustrated and he said, you know what, just because I said. And so we cl- we looked at each other. We said, you know what, we'll get back to you. So my OBGYN, we called him and told him the experience we had with the first surgeon. He suggested another surgeon in the same network. And we went to her and we wanted her to do a sonogram. Now, I should mention this. While we were doing this, we were doing vegan, we were juicing every day. I was feeling really good. So I didn't feel that it had to be a rush for me to do surgery. I wanted an opportunity to just quiet myself and get the facts. So we went to the second surgeon. We went in to have a sonogram and we told her that we needed her to specifically give us the exact measurements of the tumor so we could see whether or not it has grown or it, it, it has shrunk because of the vegan lifestyle that we had, that we were doing. Mm-hmm. And so I told Alex, make sure you're watching her when she does the measurements. So you want to tell them about the measurements, honey? Well, what happened was while she was laying down and they were doing the measurements, the doctor who was actually doing the test wasn't just doing her own test. It was like she kept looking at the chart and then adjusting, you know, with the mouse trying to click, she would get to a certain cursor click and then she would move a certain uh the the opposite direction and she would look at the chart and then she would click so it wasn't like it was an independent test i didn't feel i felt like she was trying to make sure that the numbers matched up with what they had done previously and to kind of so that's that's where i was with that and i had shared that with her so what we ended up doing was you know we had a long discussion with her about it she just gave the same diagnosis breast cancer, we should just go ahead and do a mastectomy. You're young enough, we can do reconstruction. And then we told her what our concerns were for her, not giving exact measurements. We didn't feel confident with that woman, so with that doctor, so we left. And then Alex suggested we go out of network. And I said, how is that going to work? How's, how are we going to get this covered, all the reconstruction and all the surgeries and treatments, if I'm out of network? He said, I don't know. I said, we'll just have to pray on it. So then my mother, my mother's doctor suggested we go through his friend that was a breast surgeon. That's all she does was breast surgeries. We met with her a couple weeks after and we loved her energy. We seemed, she seemed like she was very supportive. She understood I did not want to do chemo and radiation also. And she said, um, ma'am, mastectomies have come a long way. Um, since 20 years ago. So it's not as grueling. I said, okay. So um, I asked her, are you in network? And she said, no. She said, we're, you know, we're going to get this done, but we're going to submit the insurance and try, hopefully they will um, approve it. Well, she submitted the paperwork and my insurance came back immediately and denied it. So we just kept praying on it. And then I think Three weeks later, I saw my general physician and we told him about what was going on. And then he said, Tan, you know, with the insurance, a lot of people don't know, but the breast surgeon that you want, actually her insurance has merged with our insurance. So, but a lot of people don't know. They just started putting out the information. So I contacted the breast surgeon's office. I told the surgeon what the doc, what my general physician said. They resubmitted the paperwork, and thank thank goodness she did because now it was approved. So it took no more than a month after we initially talked to her and we prayed, and then my physician, my general physician, told me about the healthcare coverage is merging. So we were very happy about that. So what happened next then? So then. Um, they scheduled me for surgery in December, actually December 26th. I stayed at work. Now my department, my HR department was asking me, why are you still at work? 
We understand you have breast cancer. I said, I feel really good. I don't want to eat up my time now when I'm going to be having surgery. So I'll just stay at work. And I felt fine because us changing our, our, our diet to vegan really helped. And I had energy and it was great. So um, I had surgery December 26th. It was really hard. Um, and we started the recuperation process. I chose to t- stay off work for a year because of the type of work I ha- I'm in. I had to make sure that I was really capable of dealing with the public as well as custody. So I had to be at full strength. So while we we're off, while I was off work, um, it was really hard. Um, just reconstruction and trying to get my strength up, but we did it. I returned to work December of 2019 and I had to get acclimated back to working and dealing with the public and everything. But in January or February, February, I'm sorry, I started having pain, like a pressure in my chest, February of um, 2020. And you must have thought you I, were having I, a heart attack. Well, no, it was right in the, in my sternum area. Okay. Just a really, a really heavy pressure. Mm-hmm. But then that's the beginning of COVID. So I thought it was COVID. So my doctor started doing tests. He was like, you don't have COVID. Um, then I started having problems with my lower back, walking. I couldn't lift my legs. In order to put my pants on, I had to sit down in a chair, put my pants on the floor, and drag my pants up over my feet and ankles just to wow. get them on. And it started beca- becoming very noticeable, um, not only with my family, but also at work. So I knew there was a problem. So when my doctor did an MRI... Um, a couple months after February, he was like, Ton, there's, um, it's, it's coming back negative. I said, no, there's something wrong because I don't feel like myself. So I had a sonogram and a mammogram. And when I went for the sonogram, the technician said, there's nothing there. I said, I'm telling you, I know my body, there's something there. So she, she started getting frustrated with me. And then she said, there's nothing there. I said, there's something there. So she said, raise your left arm. When she ra- when I raised my left arm, she ran, she ran the, the machine or the little instrument over my chest. And then she said, oh, my goodness. She said, there is something there. And I said, I told you. So then she brought the doctor in. They wanted to do a biopsy right then and there. I said, no, I don't feel comfortable with that. I'd rather schedule an appointment with my doctor this coming up this week, if not next week, to have her do it. And so that's what I did. And then when my doctor um, did the biopsy, and then she also scheduled me for, um, I think it was a CT scan. She called me that evening. Um, It was, I'm sorry, I'm fast forwarding. June 26th, that's how much time it took. June 26th, um, and she called me that evening and said, I'm so sorry. She said, I'm so sorry, like eight times before I finally said, what is it? And then she said, you have breast cancer and it's spread into your bones and soft tissue of your sternum. So here you've gone from this diagnosis of stage one, get the mastectomy, everything will be good. And now you have stage four. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Wow. So this, I, this was in uh, your, your the, the other breast, right? Do I have that right? This was- this was, they said, the breast cancer that I had in my left breast, mm-hmm. they, they had done the mastectomy, but the breast cancer has spread into the bone and soft tissue of my sternum. Oh, I so see. So my okay. breast is still clear. Wow. Yeah. That's, uh, you know, we, when we talk to people, I can't imagine what goes through one's mind when you're given that diagnosis. And we've asked people uh, numerous times, the people we've interviewed, what goes through their mind. And uh, people invariably say that what happens is you, you're in this fog for about a month afterwards because it's just so devastating. The news is so devastating when you get that. Absolutely. It was really hard. Alex was very upset because once I had my initial surgery back in December, we had asked the the breast surgeon, did you get it all? And she said, yes. But 
when we when I came up with stage four and it spread into the bone and then the soft tissue of my sternum and in my lower back and pelvis, Alex asked her, I thought you said you got everything. She said, well, some of it had spread and to the lymph nodes. And that's how I got out and into the bone and into the um, my lower spine as well. Mm. See what 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 and, and and let me just say, uh, Mr. Ian, I just want to uh, 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 validate you on the part about the uh, the feeling of heart attack. Um, I don't I don't think she really she's never had she doesn't know much about heart attacks and stuff. My previous schooling was medical fire before clinical mental health, but because of that, I'm I'm very very familiar with the signs and symptoms mm-hmm. from what your question about the feeling of heart attack but what she describes is actually like the sensation of somebody experiencing something like a heart attack like the pressure continued pressure on their chest some talk about that pressure almost like a like an elephant feeling uh press press sitting on their chest and that's kind of like what she was she was feeling there was this constant pressure she couldn't it was hard to lean forward she couldn't any maneuvering it, there was just constant pressure so i do want to um say that that is almost like that feeling but I, I want to share something about that, that thing with the biopsy. You know, I raised the question to the doctor and I said, listen, I'm kind of concerned about this thing with biopsies. You know, why are we still doing bi- biopsies? Have we not evolved to the point where we don't have to cause damage to, to this to this 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 tumor? Here? And, and they said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, it's kind of like a water balloon. If you have a water balloon, you poke it with a needle. Will the water not leak? And they said, yes. I said, well, does it not work the same way with with a tumor, you know, a cancer tumor? And they said, well, and they just looked at me uh, and said, well, you know, we don't have enough uh, information to to um, to determine that that actually happens. And I said, OK, well, the flip side to that is you really don't have enough information to state that it doesn't. And. They just insisted on doing the biopsy. I was really concerned about that because if you're poking it and you're leaking out, would this not would the stuff not spread? But the interesting thing was, um, we had asked about the surgery. They said the surgery was good. Everything went well. When we asked about, you know, afterwards about the, uh, uh, they they stated that the uh, everything was clear, that the curses and everything was fine. But when the question was ra- raised about the lymph nodes, were the lymph nodes clear? And they, uh, we learned not from the doctor who did the surgery, but the current doctor that we have now. She contacted us, and she was the one that told us that the surgery didn't go as well as they made us believe. And we said, well, what do you mean? And they said, well, um, during the surgery, and I don't know why they didn't tell you this, uh, some of the cancer cells got loose. And we were like, what? Because had we known that, we would we could have stepped it up further uh, to do something about it. But they never shared that information. And um, when she went to her first uh, follow-up appointment, everything was fine. But because COVID had kicked in, she wasn't able to go to the second uh, follow-up because they weren't even accepting uh, dental appointments because of COVID. Boy, Alex, I love your questioning. I think yeah. that's fantastic. <laughs> What was the what was the next procedure? Did you undergo conventional treatment? I did. Um, I went in and had thirteen rounds of radiation initially. They did it um, the th- in th- three sections: my the soft stern, the soft tissue in my sternum, my lower back, and in my pelvis. Actually, they found that the largest tumor was sitting on my, the right side of my pelvis. And that's why I was having a very hard time walking. And those radiation treatments, treatments were extremely hard. Um, but I have to say that because Alex was able to get in contact with a friend of his that really believed in cannabis oil, he was able to get us in contact initially with um, someone who, to make it. And um, it really helped with me being able to rest and not take as much pain medicine because I was on a lot of heavy medications. And uh, how much cannabis were you taking at the time? Initially, I was only taking – well, Alice, you were measuring, so. Well, initially, we started off – so he told us, he said, listen, he said, we can help you uh, beat this cancer. And I said, really? And he said, and so he was telling me that um, 
so this mutual friend of ours, he's from Turkey, and he he was back here in the states, and then, uh, and I had met him beforehand, and the latest time that I, we, I had connected with him was at um, my friend's wedding, and we sat there and we spoke for a while, and he was telling me, yeah, he, he's he's doing amazing things, uh, he's curing people of cancer and so on. So we we got together, we met, uh, they came they came to our home, and they explained to us, you do a half grain of rice worth. And then you'll do that uh, three times a day. Uh, you'll do that for about a week, and then you'll start doubling up. You know, you go you know, about the size of a grain of rice, and you do that for about three days, and then you double up, and so on. And but the problem is that it was uh, really knocking her out, and I was concerned because, you know, um, Tun, she 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 was her pants. Uh, I think she was about a size fourteen. But uh, between like 12, 14, but when she was struggling with the cancer, she had gotten down so skinny, she was like a size two. It it was literally Mm -hmm. like I would have to wheel her around in a wheelchair. And the thing that was upsetting for me was that the doctors and nurses, uh, they 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 just functioned like like they had no sense of integrity because they would say right in front of us. Like, I know she can hear and they would stand and they would with the holding their hands going, hmm, shaking their heads. And they would say, yeah, she's, 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 uh, doesn't have much time longer uh, to go. She's, and, and, and it really upset at me. Um, because it's just not something that you should be saying to someone, but, um, yeah, it, it's just. So, so, um, we started with that during the treatments and it was helping me because, I was able to get off a lot of the medication. I was on Dilaudid. I was on um, hydrocodone four times a day, morphine tablets four times a day. A lot of medication uh, just for pain because the pain was just so intense in my bones. It mm-hmm. it was just excruciating. And um, after the 13 rounds of treatment, I started with the chemo. But I didn't do the IV chemo. I did two tablets a day. And after the chemo treatments, I started immediately with the, um, I'm sorry, after the radiation treatments, I started with the chemo treatments and it was two pills a day. And after a week and a half of being on chemo, like Ms. Corey said, chemo is chemo regardless of how you take it. Mm -hmm. Um, It was really hard on my body. It was driving. I wasn't able to... um, have a normal life. My quality of life had diminished to almost zero, to nothing. And I wasn't able to eat. I wasn't able to drink. I was having severe bouts of diarrhea. I was scared to leave the house because I needed to be near my restroom. So, um, but during that time, um, I was having a lot of medical issues so much to when I would go in for my injections for the conventional treatments for bone strengthening and also hormone therapy to stop me from producing estrogen um, to try to slow down the cancer. And they would have to put me on an IV bag um, for nutrients because I wasn't eating or drinking or anything. Mm -hmm. So how did you, uh, how did you progress from there? What, uh, I mean, you seem to be um, today, you seem to, you sound, I can't see you, but you sound like you're, you're in, in good shape. How did you move from where you were taking the radiation and chemo to more cannabis oil? Well, what happened was um, during the time I was initially on, right after my radiation treatments and initially the first two weeks of chemo, I was at my mother's house and I had asked Alex to bring my RSO my Rick Simpson oil over to my mother's house. Mm -hmm. He showed my mother how to dose it, but my mother's in an older generation. My mother's in her seventies. So she believes that you really need to listen to the doctor, all this holistic stuff. I don't know why you're even bothering with that stuff. So he showed her how to dose me. She was dosing me, but unfortunately she was giving me too much. But the good thing about it is that all it does is make you sleep. So, um, I told her, I don't understand why I'm having, why I'm feeling like this at your house, because at my house, I wasn't this sleepy. But anyway, she, um, 
I ended up going back home. She asked, she actually made the decision without notifying me. She threw away my cannabis oil. <laughs> I still and remember I, when you told me that. Yeah. Is oh she still goodness. your mother? <laughs> yes, I love her. But yes, I, you know, it was hard. After that, I had to really had to make a decision. I need to hunker down and just focus on our own household and be getting on a serious regimen of RSO. We could not get back in contact with the woman who was making it for me, which was tragic because it took about a month or two for me to, um, actually it might've been three months for me to actually get up the nerve to contact Miss Corey, because I looked at Miss Corey as like a rock star. I'm like, Oh, you know, I'll never be able to get in contact with her. You know, she's so busy with helping people around the world. And the only reason why I have a Facebook page is because I needed it to get in contact with Miss Corey. I never cared about social media before, but I knew that she would contact you if she read and had time through Facebook. So I had Alex make me a Facebook page. And after I got up the nerve to um, contact Miss Corey, Miss Corey contacted me two days later. And I was just like so elated. I just was beside myself. When I talked to Miss Corey, I gave um, her all the information, exactly the type of cancer I had, what was going on, what we had been doing. And she got me pointed in the right direction um, for me to get on some really good oil. And I have to say, when Ms. Corey mentioned that, you know, anything that you try to get at the medical dispensaries is not going to be strong enough. She's actually accurate because after my mother threw away my cannabis oil, we were trying to go to the, dis to the dispensary and getting um, cannabis oil that was supposed to be high in THC. But it just seemed like it wasn't helping me. It was not helping at all. But when I got on the right, the good oil, that's when I started noticing a difference. And that's when we started the regimen all over again with half a grain rice, the, the protocol for RSO. And I have to tell you, within a week and a half, two weeks tops, I was able to walk more. I was able to get out. I would sneak out of my house and drive my car without um, our son and my husband knowing. And I, they would just know, they thought I was in the kitchen or in the living room and I would come back in the house and they're like, what are you doing? And I'm like, oh, I just took a drive around the block or two blocks because I was just trying to get my strength up. So, um, yeah, that's what we did. And then my, er, every month I was going to see my oncologist for my injections and all the treatments and everything. And the chemo, she kept taking me off every, every few weeks she was taking me off the chemo. And then she would say, it's because it's driving your white blood cell count so low. You don't have an immune system. And during COVID, we cannot afford this to happen. So she would take me off. But every time she would take me off chemo, after a week of being off, I started feeling better. And then she put me on after three weeks or two weeks or however, however many weeks. She just kept going back and forth and changing the chemo medication. It got to be so daunting to the point where the last time she told me was the end of January, stop taking the medication. For, we're going to try for three weeks. When that three weeks time, I was able to walk, start walking without my staff. I was able to walk upright, which I wasn't able to do since June of last year. I was walking like I was 80, hunched over because the tumors were so big. I wasn't able to get any pain relief unless I bent over. But February 13th was the first day of this year that I was able to walk and walk upright without my staff and without so much pain and I was so elated I contacted Miss Corey let her know what was going on I think it was the beginning of March I was able to walk my dog from at one corner to the next corner block I was able to now walk him a mile each time we go out um and I, I would remember go that yeah I remember that. And I think I first talked to you at the beginning, middle of January, somewhere around the middle of January. Yes. But yeah, once you got on that product, and that's just for people's info of fourth strain oil. Um, yeah, you were, you just accelerated. Yes. And I have to say, I do, I do listen to a lot of the podcasts and with the breast cancer, some people do two to one ratio or one to one ratio. I did initially start on the two to one ratio and it was working, but I felt like I needed more. So myself and the contact decided I need to be on a three to one, three parts THC to one part CBD. One part and CBD. that's, 
Yes, and that's when I started flourishing. Absolutely. So it's yeah, right. So it's, it's, it's you know, we got to encourage women to not be afraid of THC because you have a hormone-driven cancer. Yes, because it actually worked. And Miss Corey, you're right when you say everyone is different. You can't. I mean, you got to just figure it out. You know, and it worked. So, so now, you know, I've been getting stronger. When we went in, I had my. I was getting scans, uh, PET scans every three months. The first PET scan when I was on the first oil my cancer had diminished by 20%. And then after that, they were saying everything was, it was, it wasn't growing. Um, but they never said it diminished. Well, when I went for my scan, my PET scan in April, um, I was feeling really good. My, um, spirits were up. I was doing way more stuff around the house. We went in for my scan and, um, I was so happy because I thought that even though this, the, the technician couldn't tell me, I felt that I was doing way better. And I have to tell people that I decided myself to stop chemo. My husband couldn't tell me. I even talked to Miss Corey. Miss Corey, remember you said, I can't decide that for you either. Is That's a, that's a personal choice. Yeah. A very personal choice. I, mm-hmm. I, I can give you, I can give you the stats. I can tell you what happens but I can't make the choice. It's very personal. Yeah. Yes. So I decided on my own and I did not tell my oncologist, only my husband and my, our immediate household, our kids knew that I chose to stop taking it because my quality of life was so poor on chemo. I said, I can't do this. And I only saw glimmers of hope when she would take me off the chemo medication. So I said, you know what? I'm going to stop taking it. And that's when the, when the, the cannabis oil, I really noticed a difference. I even in my lower back where the tumors were really big, I felt like they were either either diminishing or moving, like they weren't so big. And I told my husband, they don't seem like they're so big because I'm able to walk, I'm able to kick my leg up and everything. I don't understand. I said, we'll see in, when the when the scan comes. So we got the scan done April, the beginning of April, and then I had the results read um, April fifteenth. And when I went in, the doctor wants to ask me all these questions about everything else. I said, with all due respect, can I just have the results first? So she said, congratulations, you're stable. And I asked, well, what does stable mean? Does that mean it hasn't, it's, it hasn't diminished, it hasn't grown? What does that mean? She said, well, it means you're stable. Well, she started asking, talking about all these different things and tests. And, and I'm looking at her because I'm not understanding but Alex understood and he was smiling so hard underneath the behind his mask. I'm like looking at him like, why are you smiling? And he came over and gave me a hug. And then I hugged him back, but I just didn't understand what was going on. So I finally asked the doctor, you know what? Can you just write down in layman's terms what the um, diagnosis was, what the results um, are so that I can tell my family and close friends? So she wrote down the results. And she said, um, basically, um, your your scan shows cancer that was previously there or damage. I, I'm sorry. Let me take that back. Your scan shows previous damage from the cancer that was previously there. There is no evidence of active cancer or ongoing damage. So I well, said, oh, yeah, so that's I said, oh, so this means I'm cured. She said, oh, no, we would never say cancer and cured in the same sentence. Mm-hmm. So then I said, I started asking her questions. And then I said, I still don't understand. You said stable. To me, that sounds like there's nothing there. So then she finally looked at me because she got, I guess she got frustrated. And she said, Tan, there's no evidence of cancer. It's almost like you never had cancer in your body. So Tom, then, do you, I, do you know what an incredible miracle that is? Yes. Yeah, so then, <laughs> to be I, as far advanced as you were with it in your bones to Zilcho, yeah. because I have to tell you, I was stage four, and they had given me only a few months to live. I thought she said years, but I was on so much medication back there, and I was in a brain fog most of the time. I thought I heard years, and Alex said, "No, honey, she said months." You have months to live. And I didn't understand why 
they were trying to get hospice in the house and they were trying to have all this equipment brought in. And I really was upset. I got angry all those months because I was like, they really think I'm going to die. I don't think I'm going to die. I'm going to show these people I'm not going to die. And that's what we did. Dude, there's, there's, here, here's um, the doctor who read the results when we went last time. Well, going back to the, to the, to the uh, chemo uh, therapy. So, Tan, she kept asking me, what do you think? Should I stop? And I said, this is a decision that you have to make because it's a de decision that you have to live with. Inside, I wanted her to stop because I already knew that this stuff was working. But she had to make that decision. And so my suggestion to her was, how about this? You have a scan that's coming up. Why don't you just stop momentarily, get the chemo medication, but just don't take it. We won't tell them. And she says, well, it costs money to get this chemo medication. I said, just get it. And then when we go, if the tests reveal that we're kind of reverting back to the to the, you know, cancer, you know, not being under control, we can all you can always go back to taking it. You will have it. And then and so she said, OK, and that's what she did. And then that's when we found out that it was gone. But here's the thing. This same doctor, when we first met her, um, it, we did it via Zoom. And one of the first things she said was, you're going to die from this. That was how she introduced herself. You are going to die from this. My job is to try to figure out how to extend your life uh, as much as possible so you have time to get your house in order. And, and I thought, you know, if we were in a hospital, this would be considered like bad bedside manners. How do you tell someone in the same breath that you're introducing yourself and saying hello that you're, you're starting off? You're going to die. This? You know, and so that was that was the first thing. And then and then and then as as Tun mentioned, um, it got to the point where they started sending all these people to the house. It was like this doc, I mean, a nurse, this and a nurse, that, and some other person. And this one guy comes in with brochures. They want to, uh, and until finally I was like, wait, what is this? Who are you? What is this you're pushing? And they were trying to get into, into hospice. And one of the things that was really upsetting was it got to the point where I was really scared to take her to her appointments because one of the appointments that I'd taken her to, because I told the guy, get the hell out of my house. Uh, when we got to the doorway, you know, I, I used some choice language mm -hmm. and spoke to someone else. I said, you know, don't ever step foot on my property again. And one of the times that I took a uh, turn to her appointment, um, I was telling her, come on, hurry up. We got to get out of here. And so we were getting her. We didn't we didn't even get the clothes on what, what we kept the hospital gown on. And I just slipped the, the, her sweat jacket over and zipped and we got out of there. I spoke to one of the nurses because I had to make a call to speak to someone. And she said, and this was the thing that was upsetting. She said that they had plans on admitting her, having her admitted into hospice, but I had gotten her out, gotten her out of the hospital too quick for them to get there. And so that told me that, oh, so they were gonna take her away. And I thought about how people, had it been a child, they probably would have taken my child for like child abuse or child neglect. And, you know, we had to intervene. They just aren't, they're making poor choices. And that's what, where I felt we were, what we were up against. And the reason why is that I told her, I said, you know, if you were to go into hospice, I'm never going to, I'm never going to see you again. All of these assisted living facilities, everyone's catching COVID. I'm not going to see you. You're, you're sick. Your, 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 your immune system has been compromised. It just was a, a horrible experience. Um, but I knew that this this oil was working because the first batch that was brought to us, he said, listen, this is on me. Uh, you guys just take this and, you know, do your next uh, set of labs or whatever you got to do. And then let me know what you think. And that's when we learned that it had diminished by 20 percent. And um, and um, the. And, and, and it, the whole thing with her mom throwing out the, and it was much deeper than that. You know, her mom yeah. basically threw it out because her mom doesn't like me and she knew it was coming from me. And she, and I told her, she said, so this is saving her life. I said, it is, it is. And she even told her that, uh, and when I take this, it takes away the pain. I don't have to rely on all of this pain medication. And the mom just didn't like the idea and she threw it out. And so when I spoke to her mom, when I went over there, she says, you know, I did that. Be I did it because that's what I wanted to do. You know, she's she's my responsibility. I said, no, once we got married, we raised we started raising a family. She became my responsibility. Uh, she, your job as a mother is to be supportive 
if and when she calls you for support. And so that, but um, uh, the, the, the thing that's really upsetting about this is that I'm learning that there's a lot of people, a lot of frauds out there claiming to be connected to certain people or, or providing certain services. And they're really not. And there's, you know, I, I, I even had an experience where people were coming to me saying, oh, you know, I sell CBDs or I sell tinctures and go to my website. And these are the kinds of things that my understanding <clears throat> that will help someone who has cancer, it'll help them help send them to their death. Because my understanding is that the CBD helps with pain, but it doesn't cure cancer. It's the the, the THCs and the other elements that's that's in this uh, uh, medicinal plant that helps with curing. I'm still I'm still learning, so I'm not sure. But it's just amazing when somebody hears that someone's sick with this, that all of a sudden they're doctors and they have the cure and come come to my website and buy this and buy that. But you know, Alex, that. it's it's interesting what you say because when Corey and I started this podcast uh, a number of years ago, we decided to just to focus on medical cannabis, not recreational. And then yes. as more states in the U.S. opened up to recreation, uh, recreational and some medical in Canada went uh, legal, we get requests periodically from companies that want to sell their CBD oil. And yep. uh, we've decided not to have any sponsors on this program because we don't know the quality of the CBD oil. And the CBD oil is not going to help people like your wife uh, combat her cancer. Yes. And uh, so I think it's, it's a remarkable story what you've told us, Ton. Ton, when you go back to work, uh, can you still – can you work in law enforcement and take cannabis at the same time? Actually, um, I think it depends on each individual department. The department that I work for, there's nothing in the policy that stipulates that you are not allowed to consume or take cannabis oil mm -hmm. or cannabis products, especially if you have a medicinal marijuana car, which I do have. Mm -hmm. um, but I have to say that I'm not going back. I'm retiring. I think this is a sign. I need to be in a less stressful environment. The good thing is I have well over 20 years of law enforcement, and so I can retire that's the blessing. So I don't have to work, but I want to do something else with the next half of my life. And that's to help other people. And I think this is a great avenue to help people. Miss Corey and Mr. Ian, you are, you're godsend. And I have to say that I'm going to try to say this without being emotional. I have to say that. Thank you so much <laughs> for having this, this website and podcast available to thousands of people around the world because I just so happened on Cannabis Health Radio. I didn't know about it before I was started researching um, medicinal marijuana and cancer treatments and things like that. I just It was just luck of the draw that I found you guys. And because of your podcast, I don't just, I didn't just listen to breast cancer. I listened to all the podcasts. I made sure this time when I got cancer, um, when I was diagnosed, I started listening after I came out of the fog at the beginning of this year, I started listening to three podcasts first thing every morning when I go walk my dog as part of my meditation. I make sure I listen to all of them because you end up having so many different side effects from the chemo and radiation treatments that you try to find different ways to combat it. And I did hear people say, that high CBD was working for pain. So that's what I do for, like if I have lower back pain, now I only take one morphine tablet a day. That's if I remember. Most time I don't, which is great. Um, and, but for CBD, but I still take one gram um, of the cannabis oil every day. And we've already discussed it. We've decided I'm going to take that for the next year because now I need to combat um, the bone, I need to, I need to make sure that I can strengthen my bones and combat all the other ailments that I ended up having the lower back pain and everything, because my, my bone where I did have cancer, it looks like, it looks like Swiss cheese now. So now we're trying to re re strengthen my bones. I'm trying to get my, um, strength back. Um, and the CBD, I just, if I have a headache, I don't have headaches every day, but if I have a headache and I was going to take a Tylenol, I just put a few drops 
of C high CBD oil on my fingertips. Alex also put some in a roller, like a little um, mm -hmm. perfume roller for me. I rub it on my um, temples. I massage it in. In 20 minutes, no more, no more headache. My lower back, I do the same thing. 20, 30 minutes later, the pain is manageable. Why I don't even feel like I need a Tylenol. Yeah, your story, uh, the two of you, uh, it's a remarkable story, and we're so happy that uh, things are turning out uh, positively for you. One day, the four of us will have to get together and uh, share a glass of wine, because I know Corey likes wine. Well, I'll force some down your throat, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And I have to say, I have to say um, this one last thing. For people who are just wondering, should I take it? Would it work for me? Are you scared? Just try it. If you've already been given a sentence of cancer or any other serious ailment, health issue, regardless of what it is, you can try it. It's not going to do anything. All it's going to either do is make you sleepy because I, um, and when I took it, I didn't even take it um, sublingually all day. I took it rectally three times a day. And then at night for that restful sleep, eight to 10 hours of sleep, I would take it sublingually, just put, just put a dip of toothpick in the oil and put it underneath my tongue. And I get at least eight to 10 hours. And I feel so refreshed when I wake up. Everybody should try it, especially if you have loved ones or people you care about. You will not lose anything. Can I say, can I share something? I, I just want, I want to say that uh, for those who are still struggling with this, it all starts in the mind. You know, I really believe that, you know, it's a scary thing. You know, like I told my wife, death is at our doorstep, but we don't have to invite them in. And with that, you know, I was telling her, it all starts in the mind. When people say, you know what, it's too hard, I can't do something, they have already set themselves up for failure because they planted that negative seed. You have to think more optimistically. You have to say, I can do this, and you can do it. The mind is a power, the most powerful muscle in the body. That in conjunction with these things that have been put here on this earth for us to combat these, these, these ailments, together you know work together my wife she couldn't eat anything like i said uh, before she was dealing with cancer she was a uh, a size 12 she got down to like a size two once she started taking this oil she started eating her energy was up she's now her her pants she's like about a size eight now and this is somebody who i had to wheel around in a wheelchair when she after after a couple of weeks a week and a half, I would say she was out of the wheelchair. She would walk around with the staff. You know, those who don't know what a staff is, the, the walking stick like Moses. Mm -hmm. She had to walk with that. Now she's walking every day three times. The, how much, how, how far are you walking now? A mile and four blocks each time. A mile and four blocks each time. And her, her, her energy level is up. She's smiling. She's eating regularly. Um, my quality of life is like night and day when I compared to when I was on chemo. But I have to say, if people are scared they're going to get high, you're not going to get high. Like Miss Corey said, if you take it rectally, mm -hmm. and that's what we did. It is so much easier. It's not messy. You, people don't even know that you're on it, but it definitely combats whatever ailments you have in your body if you take it rectally. Guys, we very much appreciate you doing this. Thanks very much and uh, for telling your wonderful story. Thank you. And just a reminder that Cannabis Health Radio is a listener-supported podcast. We have no sponsors, as we've mentioned, so we rely on support of listeners to keep us going. And if you'd like to make a one-time donation or a monthly donation for as little as a cup of coffee, please go to our website, Cannabis Health Radio, and make a donation. Ton and Alex have made a donation, and to them, we thank them very much. And for those who have done so, we thank you as well. And don't forget to share our podcasts on the social media platform of your choice. We'd like to get the message out to as many people around the world on the medical benefits of cannabis. And thanks for your support. We'll be back again next week with another episode of Cannabis Health Radio. Thanks for listening to Cannabis Health Radio. For more information and to search previous podcasts, visit our website, CannabisHealthRadio.com Subscribe so you don't miss new episodes. And follow us on Facebook, Instagram,
Instagram, and Twitter. This podcast is made possible by donations from our listeners. If you found the information helpful, please consider making a donation in any amount through our website. You can also help us share our message by leaving a review on your podcast listening platform. We are very grateful for your support. Thank you.